Uh, my guest today on the Pocket Master Mind podcast uh, is a omni content creator, host of the Polycast, uh, and he defines himself as a poly innovator. Uh, and if you're not sure what poly innovator is, like I wasn't, uh, he's here to tell us now. So, Dustin Miller, welcome to the Pocket Master Mind podcast. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So- it's interesting that we are talking about the podcast and whatnot, especially before the show. And one thing I was mentioning earlier is that a lot of people say like a podcast. And so like iPods came around and so people listened to the cast on there. So the podcast came around, but podcast is kind of my anticonformist towards that idea of podcast being <laughs> iPod. Yeah. And also the other kind of talk about, we were talking about the poly or the much or many in Greek. And so I wanted to take that concept for the podcast and talk about a lot of different things. I didn't want to choose just one niche, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And that comes down to all the other stuff I create as well, like the Omni content series. I didn't want to create just one thing. I wanted to be able to talk about everything, the Omni of my life. Yeah, it makes sense. And you, know, you and I are similar in that regard. Everyone says, oh, you've got to focus on this one thing. But actually, my interest is too broad. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to necessarily focus on one individual thing uh, as a theme, personal mm-hmm. achievement um and what that means but within that there's all sorts of stuff so uh tell us a bit about the uh describe poly innovator to us mm-hmm. well and to describe poly innovator i'll have to describe what a polymath is so a polymath is someone who's heavily interested and or heavily knowledge in many areas so such as that poly that we mentioned earlier and so I've always been an inspired at polymath. I've always had that kind of interdisciplinary inclination in my life. And so even when I first started doing my uh, day job back in 2012 or so, I uh, started doing like lifeguarding and then swim instructor and then water aerobics and then water pool management, then fitness, then the personal training. And I did a lot of those all at once. It was something that was a very divergent workplace for myself there. And that's, it was that's naturally what I wanted to do. And so this divergent mindset came into about when I started creating content as well. My first brand, United Living Construct, way back when, is what instigated my interest in content creation back in 2011 when I was creating blog posts. And this led into the skills down the line to make polycasts and videos and omni content. And what were you, what were you blogging about back in the beginning? So what's interesting is that I actually created the United Living Construct, the ULC, to be like a hub of innovation. So I still had this whole innovation mindset, even way back then. And I realized that I wasn't good enough when I created that, uh, especially down the line towards 2016, 2017, when I was working on it again. And so cause there, was a, there was a time there where I took a break, high school and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And so um, I pivoted. I was like, okay, I need to be better in order to accomplish this goal. And so I knew that a personal brand was a way to go about it, especially someone told me a year prior that I should have done that. And so it was funny that I didn't listen to that advice at that point. And so I created Poly Innovator. And actually, it came from the idea of Poly Ulcian, which is a kind of term that I use as kind of like a polymath for the ULC. And so Poly Innovator makes it a little bit more easy to roll off the tongue and people to understand because it's a polymath of innovation. That makes sense. I mean, so where are your where are your main points of interest? <laughs> so currently, it's been around self development, self education. So my first phase of content that I'm working on, I thought about it in phases because I thought that I can't just do a whole bunch of niches at once, and it's, a, it's not going to work for SEO purposes and growth and focus. So I'm going to focus on one, then focus on another, focus on another. So the next phase is going to be polymath exercise, considering my backgrounds in f- physical nature. Mm-hmm. I should talk about that. And then down the line, I hope to go into music and gaming and that kind of thing. What are your, um, what are your immediate goals and objectives? Organizational kind of systems at this point. I, despite the fact that I've cultivated systems when it comes to creating content, and I think we talked about this a little bit earlier too, and might go into, I use a tool called Notion to organize yeah. all of my uh, areas of interest, personal and professional. And so when it comes to just being able to accomplish that, I realized that I needed to work on execution at this particular point. I finally got the strategy involved. I took Gary V 64 piece content model, being able to take a video and make it to 64 pieces and expanded that to about 107. And I'm still trying to apply that strategy to what I'm doing execution wise to actually get that 107 or hundred pieces of content. What's Pretty interesting. Hard. He's got a team of people though, hasn't he? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, there's, there's tools out there. So there's a matter of automation strategy and 
personal engagement. So mm -hmm. people often scoff at automation, but if you do it right, you should be able to get away with it without like making yourself sound robotic. So for example, when I make a blog post, my campaign strategy is to send it out the day of, day later, week later, month later, maybe half year later, and then a year later. And so most of the content I create is evergreen anyways. It spreads it out over time, so it gets the maximum reach for the audience to see it. But when you do that, you're gonna be like, hey, I made this post last week. You gotta be contextual about it. Mm -hmm. Or I made this, hey, I made this really awesome post yesterday. I sent it out in the morning, so I'm sending it out today in the evening, so that way you get a chance to see it too. Let's, let's talk a bit about the, a bit more on the Omni content, about how do you, how do you do on your Omni content? How do you, is that repurposing of different content across different platforms, right? In different formats. Yeah. So I, I really want to approach people. I'm, I'm a didactic person. I like to teach. And so when I make my content, it's going to have a little bit of a didactic feel. And so when, if I'm going to approach this in an educational format, I want to be able to have people who learn differently be able to still learn that information. So there's auditory, visual, uh, uh, people wanting to read and that kind of thing. So since my background starts out in blogging, that's actually what I start with, which is actually counter to the norm. People often start with a video first. So I start with a blog post turn that into a slideshow, which I still think is valuable, especially for SEO purposes. Mm -hmm. And then take the visualization of the slideshow and a talking head like we're doing here and creating a video out of it. And I take the audio out of that and put it into my polycast. And um, when did you start then doing the polycast? How long, how long has that been up and running? So what's interesting about that is that when I created the United Link Construct, I started a podcast through there. And since the content is basically the same information for the most part, I actually kept that as part of the series. It took me a minute to think like, oh, I should keep this. I was going to make it just a new series, but I thought that having that backlog would be important. So I started out with the ULC Tech podcast and then made some polycast episodes. I even started doing this Fireside Micro Polycast, which was like a more personal, short form kind of uh, blurbs. And then recently in the past month and a half, I started having interviews on my show because of everything going on, everyone was more free. And I've had like over 20 interviews just in the past month. So it's been insanely busy, but really cool. And so there's a lot of different formats there. I have long form interviews, medium form, omni content and polycasts because they're sometimes different. And then I have the short form micro polycasts. What's next for you? What you, mm -hmm. what's, what is, What's, what's, where's your fulfillment coming from at the moment and where do you think you're moving to next? So like I said, I started having guests on my show and that's been really interesting and it's a, a mind-opening experience and it's been learning too. I had to teach myself how to be better at active listening. That was actually something I decided from before I even had my first guest is that I need to get better at this. I've always been a talker. I've always been gregarious and so I had a hard time not interrupting people, that kind of thing. And so that's been a progress for my personal development. And then professionally, I'm making all these connections with awesome people like yourself coming on the show too. And so David, I'm really wanting to expand more mm -hmm. and create more. I'm not, I need to monetize so I can focus more on Poly Innovator and stop doing more day jobs as much. But um, I'm more focused on building traffic and just a community and that kind of thing. What's, um, I was going to ask you, what's most important to you right now? Creating. At this point, I want to get more consistent with the Omni content at least once a week or something like that. Uh, it's not too hard to actually create the content. It's just a matter of having that willpower and motivation to do it, especially if I'm busy with work and the polycast. Because the polycast is like my sub-series. As much as that's been my focus lately, my main series is the Omni content. And the last part of the Omni content goes into the polycast. So it's one of the sub-series that I have on the show. But the polycast itself... You have the polycast as like actual main series on its own, which I only have a few episodes of it as itself because it's not really, it's it's only when I really, really want to make it at this point. And then I had the Omni content, which is more consistent. I had the interviews, which is more consistent every day on Tuesdays, for example. And then the Fireside Mic of Polycast is not very consistent. It's not really meant to be, but it's interesting how inconsistent with all that and actually starting to see that growth over time is what's really focusing on. How do you go about learning new skills? Mm -hmm. there a particular, do, you, do, you, do you watch YouTube videos? Do you read books? Is it a combination of all of these things? What's, what, how do you go about uh, developing yourself? So it comes down to a little trifecta that I've been trying to cultivate over the years. I coined another term, a science policy innovator and all this other stuff. It's called self edudevement. So a com combination of self-education, self-improvement and self-development. And I, I made this coin term because I wanted to organize a way to 
exponentially grow somebody. So if you have self-education, that acts like a foundation. And that's kind of what built up a lot of my poly innovator stuff. So I had to teach myself all these marketing skills and all of these content creation skills, repurposing. I remember opening up hundreds of tabs when it came to content repurposing just like a couple months ago or no, probably six months ago at this point, and just almost melting my computer. That's a gaming PC, mind you. It, it can handle it. And I almost melted it because there were so many tabs. And, um, and I, I just went on videos, podcasts, and blog posts and just read and consumed as much as possible so I could get a swath of information. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really important to get that divergentness. And that might be coming from the polymath mindset as well. Next step came into the self-improvement. And so I kind of talked about James Clear before the interview earlier today, but uh, I was actually watching a motivational video by him. And he was talking about how people often fail at consistency or motivation because of the lack of clarity. And so I thought, okay, how do I get clarity on self-improvement? That consistency of that 1% growth each day. And so it comes down to systems. So for example, before the quarantine, I worked as a personal trainer and a fitness instructor and all this kind of awesome roles So I just worked out when I felt like working out because I was already there. I had already made that kind of system in place. So when the quarantine hit, as much as I actually worked out, I actually didn't work out that much during the self quarantine. And so it's interesting how that system kind of failed because I had already connotated that with something else. I still worked out, I think more than most people did eventually, but it still was kind of like a hard thing to get back into. Well, the, 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 the habit that you had ingrained is obviously is then removed without choice right so yeah. it comes far harder you've got to cut co- got to create a new routine in an unusual environment i've had the same problem right it's kind yeah. of my living room has become a gym become a podcast mm-hmm. studio there's all sorts of multi-purposing now and it does make it harder yeah definitely and i think one other factor involved too is the self-development which i see as a catalyst for exponentiality and mm-hmm. so when you combine those especially in that order you get the foundation the consistency and then exponential growth you really can make a lot more progress especially in a year's time let alone 10 years time you've got to kind of know in which direction you want to head haven't you and and mm-hmm. otherwise you can you can chase you know they say the old say no man who chases two rabbits catches none mm-hmm. and you've got to kind of you know i think we talked about this a bit earlier was you need to know have some kind of vision of mm-hmm. what you want your life to look like where do you want to go some kind of direction you don't need to know an end destination one question i hate is draw a picture of your life in 10 years why does it have to be 10 years why don't you draw what your ideal life is that you you could click your fingers now yeah if you could turn it into anything now turn it that then work out where you are versus that and build a plan to get towards it as fast as you possibly can i think the old kind of where do you see yourself in 20 years is as outdated as the education system Yes, definitely. And we'll definitely get into that here in a little bit too, I feel like. But yeah. so David, you also kind of mentioned there, kind of alluding to focus. And a lot of people talk about a jack of all trades, master of none, but also master of one. So it's interesting how people often seek jack of all trades or even polymath as someone who's unfocused and someone who's lacking a capability. But one thing I've been trying to share this knowledge of is I see it more as a spectrum. So you have jack of all trades, someone who has wide width of knowledge, but not very deep. And that might be kind of bad in some cases, but it alludes to curiosity and mm-hmm. growth. You have to have that with in order to learn more. And then you have more of a generalist, someone who's more adept, maybe a novice, maybe maybe something like kind of in the middle ground, someone who actually wants to learn more and actually has studied more in those areas and maybe niched down a little bit. And but still has a wide ranging more than a specialist. Mm-hmm. Then you have the universalist. So someone who is really good in many areas. And I would consider myself more at this point at this stage of my life, someone who really has a wide ranging uh, areas of knowledge. And then finally you have polymath on top of that, someone who's mastered or heavily dug into many areas, like Leonardo da Vinci, for example. Yeah. 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 I guess he's probably the best example you could. uh... True polymath right there. Yeah, exactly. There's another tier, true polymath. (laughs) Yeah. It's it, and it's it's true. I think, um, and you look at uh, like the best CEOs, and you look at um, founders. Quite often, they tend to be not specialists, right? Because you hire specialists to do particular roles and particular jobs. And I think if you go too special, too specialist too early, mm-hmm. run yourself into a, a dead dead end, and then you've got this scary jump Uh, you know i don't want to do that either you don't want to do what you want you were doing or what you were doing has become irrelevant and then what do you do 
right? You've got to then this leap in the middle of your life at some point to try and do something different. It's going to feel like going backwards. It's really difficult. So I think... Well, I think it comes down to the education system and it's very archaic. It's, it, yeah. it was the university systems in general was made to be an expansion of knowledge like hundreds of years ago. But when the industrial revolution hits, it just basically kind of just melted that and just focused on more on just specializing the person for the industrial revolution, like factories and Ford and all these different companies that want these people to do this one job really well. And that system just hasn't changed for a hundred years, 150 years. And so um, when it comes to this modern time as well, you're seeing a lot more liberal arts program degrees. And that comes down to because that's the only degree you can get as an interdisciplinary student. I have a friend who's wanting to help me with marketing for Poly Innovator. His degree is in interdisciplinary studies because he was more of a polymathic person. He wanted to have that wide ranging. Mm-hmm. So there's no degree for that. And that's one thing I came across myself is that there was no degree for someone like me. I wanted to learn about smart cities. That's just something I want to work towards in the future. I wanted to learn about innovation because poly innovator. I wanted to learn about polymaths. There's no studies on polymaths. That's one reason why I like doing the polymath polycast because you, people can learn more about these kind of people. And each time I have that episode, I ask my guest, hey, uh, what is a polymath to you? And the answers I get are so wide ranging and interesting that it really creates this kind of movement in a way that I've been seeing that a lot of people besides myself have been trying to get more people to be interested in this interdisciplinary field. Yeah. It's interesting you talk about uh, the education system and then we, we did, you know, you and I spoke about this earlier is it's just not equipped for the modern era, right? Even Mm -hmm. never mind the subjects that probably don't fit lots of people. Um, You know, in my career up to now, I've worked with, lots of people who spent a lot of time and a lot of money going through college that are not using the, yeah. the education that they paid for. Right? Yeah. And they think that's a huge amount of money that's gone down the drain. Um, and, and the, at the speed, I think you, 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 when we were talking earlier, you, you talked about this and the speed of innovation in the world is so rapid that half the stuff that you're learning in college or in school by the time it's got to the education system, it's, it's already been superseded by a, a newer version of everything. Yeah. Well, and I think the example I use is that the accreditation system, especially in the U.S., takes a couple of years to actually go through. And so by the time it gets to the colleges and then on to the actual lectures, just, it actually just gets basically already overridden, especially in programming or marketing, something in more digital fields. So if you're learning something about the medical field, yes, there's a lot of new innovations, but considering the regulatory factors of the medical field, a lot of them still take a while to get back into place anyway. So if you learn stuff in your medical school, you're still going to probably use that. Same with lawyer field, stuff like that. In fact, lawyers, you really do need to look at the history, unlike having the new changes. And so there's a matter of specialists, but even in those fields, the ones who are being really successful are the dual specialists or multi-specialists. So the polymaths of the medical field, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, you. Yeah, I think diversification of of all sorts. As long as you're, as long as you've got some kind of idea of where where you want to head and why you're learning other things or why you're you're adding other strings to your bow, then it kind of makes sense. Otherwise, you can very easily get distracted, right? You can chase too many different things, and, and so you've got to. I think it sounds to me like you've kind of gone on a bit of a logical journey where you've added. Added, added added skills to your skill set as you built from one thing to the other right so you've got your your blog and then you do different content and it's you've kind of learned those skills and expanded almost from a core would you say that's yeah so i mean there i think there's two ways to go approach polymathy and i've i've been exploring this idea recently is that you have your width and you have your depth And a lot of times people think that if you don't focus on one, you're not going to get really good at it. But I also think that there's some people who literally can't focus on one for a really long period of time. If you have ADHD, for example, I know there's people out there who can hyper-focus on one thing for 12 hours straight, but in the next two weeks, they won't even touch it. So there's a matter of like understanding those kind of people. And the current so cool system completely disregards those kind of learning abilities. If you can hyper-focus like that, that's insane how much you can learn in that time period. But, um, so there is the width and just building up all the trees as once versus the depth of doing one tree, then one tree, then one tree. And I think that a lot of people actually become polymath money in their life anyways, because if you're working for one company, you're starting out entry level, getting really good at that, then becoming a manager, getting really good at that, then becoming a 
top tier executive becoming really good dad. Those are different careers, essentially. Like even yeah. though they're, they're the same company, it's different jobs, different knowledge, different skills. So you end up becoming a master of both of those areas, mm-hmm. maybe depending on how skilled level you are. And then by the end of your life, even different companies, you have multiple areas that you're mastered. You became a polymath. You just didn't know it. And then there's also the building it all up once. And I, I'm, I worry that if people try to do that, they'll fail. But the ones who try to do it, who don't fail and actually get really good at doing that, I think are going to be really interesting polymaths down the line. So talk to us about the, the four pillars. Okay. So when it comes down to, that's actually one of the first things I cultivated back when I was creating the United Construct, because it's something that I was pursuing myself. I was like, okay, I remember being like, what, 2014, something like that, 2015, I think it was. And I'm sitting here like, I want to do courses. I want to exercise. I want to meditate. I want to read. I want to do Duolingo. I want to do my fun habits. I want to create content. How do I do all these different habits and like create, create a system that allow me to do it? And I was frustrated. It's like, how, how the hell can I do this? And especially because I was probably what a teenager at the time, I didn't have as much willpower. I didn't have as much like discipline at that particular point. I think compared to my peers, I probably did when it came to self-education, but not so much in my habits. And over the years, I found that I've actually started doing a lot of those naturally. I started cultivating the systems because I had chosen to do so. And I think that the four pillars philosophy has helped with that a lot mm-hmm. because you have the mind. How can you cultivate the intelligence and the understanding of how the brain works and just understanding of just the mental realm as well and how you're just focusing on one thing, focus, concentration, memory, all these different areas. That's a bit important aspect. Then you have the body, your nutrition, the exercise. A lot of people don't exercise mm-hmm. and I, I, I can't wrap my head around that. I mean, I understand that people have health issues that prevent some uh, execution, but no matter what experience you're happening, there's people who don't have legs who've learned to exercise. There's people who have lupus or cancer who still exercise and it helps them. It helps them not only be happier, but move progressive. And then there's the spirituality, which doesn't have to be context with religion. It just has to be something to explore yourself. And one way I like to see it is the bridge between the conscious mind and subconscious mind. And that bridge through meditation often can be built up as well as helps with the mental pillar as well. And then finally, you have the emotions pillar. When, when you see a lot of these self-development philosophies out there, they, there's a lot of similarities to what I've been cultivating. Four pillars, uh, four areas of yoga, for example, or even just the Aristotle uh, philosophy of logos and not, not Aristotle, but the Greek philosophy of logos and that kind of thing. Uh, I try to cultivate all those ancient philosophies into a more modernized context and people don't understand their emotions very well. They, they certainly don't understand the emotions of others a lot of the time as well. So emotional intelligence comes into play. Definitely. And I think um, that's where the meditation and um, that angle can really help you distance yourself from the thoughts and emotions, become an observer rather than being the emotion or the thought and the power that then gives you to, to be able to take that step back in any situation um, will make a huge difference in your life. I've definitely found it. Definitely. And sorry if I went on a tangent there, but I got excited. No, no, it's, it's good. Eh? I think we could probably talk about this for forever, but um, I have looked, just looked at the time and we're, we're, we're cruising on through. So um, where can people find you? So I have two links that people can find me through polyinnovator.space is my main home website. I actually try to work really hard at creating an omni-channel presence. So if you find Poly Innovator, or if you find any kind of platform, you can search Poly Innovator and generally find me. I actually encourage people to try to find some obscure blockchain platform or some kind of like unique platform and try to find Poly Innovator through there. Uh, but, and then the other one would be pod.co slash polycast if you want to listen to my show. Brilliant. Well, it's been a really interesting talking to you and hopefully we'll, um, we'll talk again soon. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Brilliant. Cheers, Dustin.